For 10 whole years, he didn't touch a single bite of food or a drop of water. Instead, he spent his days training super hard in some really dangerous places, putting himself through all kinds of pain on purpose, because he was on a mission to become a godlike figure in the world. It all started 2500 years ago. There was a big fight between the kingdoms of Kozala and Magadha over the river Ganges and the city called Kapilavathu. The palace in Kapilavathu got attacked by Kosala and the people who got caught in the war had to suffer. Not only they lost their families, but they also suffered from hunger and the lack of jobs. The people could only hope that one day, someone special would be born and help them get out of this situation. Until one day, the son of the king of Kapilavathu was born. On the day Prince Siddhartha was born, everyone could feel an intense aura in the air. The sun shone bright like never before and the people realized he was blessed by the gods. The villagers are amazed and all the animals gathered to see this special event. The villagers celebrate the arrival of the heir of Shakya and everyone congratulates the king. Even though Maya is happy about the blessings being showered on her son, she feels weak and faints. King Prajapati and his soldiers hurry back to the city when they hear the news that the queen is in danger. When Prajapati reaches Maya, she presents baby Siddhartha to him. He lovingly holds the baby and Maya shares that she wants to name him Siddhartha, meaning someone who achieves his goal. Prajapati likes the name a lot, but things get scary when Maya starts to feel pain. She asks to hold the baby and Prajapati gives Siddhartha to her. Maya says Siddhartha will be extraordinary and have great faith. She caresses her baby one last time before passing away. Prajapati can only hold his son close as Siddhartha cries for the loss of his mother. A priest named Asita pays a visit to King Prajapati, who feels honored that the priest came to see them. Asita and Prajapati go to Siddhartha's room, but Asita is shocked when he sees the baby. Prajapati asks for the reason, and Asita tells him to look at how the baby has one finger pointed to the sky and another finger pointed to the ground. This signifies he is the most revered on heaven and earth, meaning that this child is going to be the king of the world. Prajapati is shocked by this revelation. Asita is amazed but adds that, unfortunately, he will not be alive to witness Siddhartha grow. Ten years later, Siddhartha is being entertained by some dancers, but he's not impressed. He gets tired and walks away from the dancers to the balcony. There, he stares at something with anger on his face. Fadartha joins the other children as an elder tells them to grow up quickly and become great warriors to defeat Kosala. Siddhartha gets up and asks the elder if the war will really lead to death. The elder says there are some survivors, but Siddhartha wants to know what happens to a person after they die. The elder mentions a funeral, but Siddhartha persists, asking what happens to the dead after the funeral. The elder shuts him down, saying he came to teach, not to debate. Siddhartha sits down, feeling sad. However, a kid named Jedka whispers to him that they should go play because the lesson is boring. Another kid agrees, and the two boys drag Siddhartha away to go play. The boys are hunting a rabbit with their makeshift bow and arrow. Jedka misses the first shot, and the rabbit runs away. They chase after it, cornering it. Jedka is about to take another shot when Siddhartha jumps on him to stop him. The rabbit escapes as the arrow misses. Jedka asks what Siddhartha's deal is, pushes him away, and then he and the other boy go to hunt another animal. Siddhartha feels sad and starts thinking about hunting living creatures. He wanders into the forest, and the animals nearby aren't scared of him. They come out of their hiding to look at him. However, the moment is short-lived as Jedka falls into a swamp and can't get out. He's sinking in, calling for help. Siddhartha hears him and rushes over to help. The other kid is trying to reach Jedka, while Siddhartha, seeing the situation, goes over to a branch. He lowers it with his body weight, and the other boy jumps on the branch too. The branch becomes low enough for Jedka, who desperately tries to hold on to it, but can only grab the edge, which snaps immediately as he grabs it. Jedka is still crying for help, but it's too late as he is completely submerged in the swamp. Siddhartha and the other kid are in shock. The news reaches the people, and they all rush to the forest. Jedka's mom cries at the loss of her son, and the people gather around to console her. Siddhartha walks away from the group, feeling sad, when he's called by his stepmom. Siddhartha wants to hide his crying face from everyone but can't. He runs into his stepmom's arms, crying. His stepmom hugs him, grateful that he's okay, but also consoles him as he weeps profusely, saying Jedka is dead. Siddhartha becomes weak from crying and faints in his mom's arms. She holds him tightly, weeping along with her son. His stepmom takes him to his room to rest. The maid informs them about King Prajapati's arrival, but Siddhartha is so ashamed of himself as he lays in bed, turning his face from his mother. She tells him that everything will be okay and he should get some sleep. 
Then, she leaves him to rest and meets with the king, who asks her how Siddhartha is doing. She apologizes, blaming herself and saying her dereliction of duty caused the situation to happen. King Prajapati tells her that Maya was weak after giving birth to Siddhartha, but she must show more love to Siddhartha than Maya. She thanks him for his kind words. He then says that Siddhartha is old enough to take martial arts training. Siddhartha, who isn't asleep, can hear all their conversation. Siddhartha is learning how to shoot an arrow, and the instructor is yelling while giving him instructions. Siddhartha is struggling to pull the bow. The soldiers start sparring with each other, but they stop when they see Siddhartha's partner being too violent. They're worried for the prince. Siddhartha is holding up against his sparring partner, who attacks him with full force. Siddhartha tries to block the attack with his shield, but loses it and falls to the ground. He has to hurry back to avoid all the attacks from hurting him. Five years later, Siddhartha is sparring with his partner, and the soldiers watching are amazed, commenting on how he has gotten better. Siddhartha can counter and attack his opponent without fail. His father is proud to see his son has gotten better. His opponent praises him for getting so strong, smiling at his achievement of teaching Siddhartha. However, Siddhartha is not happy as he sheaths his sword and walks away. A soldier rushes in to deliver an emergency letter as the war against Kozala is about to begin. Siddhartha asks his father why they need to fight, and his father says that they've been able to avoid the war in recent years, but not this time. His father tells him to make a good start. Siddhartha asks what that means, and his father says Siddhartha should defeat Kozala, inherit his place, and become the king of their country. But Siddhartha questions his father on why there is war, why are humans killing each other. His father yells at him, saying if they don't fight, Kozala won't be conquered. Still, Siddhartha isn't convinced. His father asks him how he intends to be a king with this mindset. As the war begins, Kosala and Shakya charge towards each other, not caring about the village between their clashing zones. Siddhartha watches from above, as the countries battle it out, trampling over the village. Shakya rains arrows on Kosala's front lines, ending them. However, Kosala's war leader keeps advancing, urging his men to follow. Siddhartha sees the piles of bodies and can't stand to watch. He advances with his men into the battlefield. Both sides attack each other with everything they've got. The king rides his horse, taking down some of Kozala's men, but the Kozala leader and his soldiers still have the upper hand, easily wiping out Shakya's soldiers. Siddhartha rides into the battlefield, yelling at them to stop, but his cries fall on deaf ears. Siddhartha is surrounded by Kozala soldiers who identify him as the prince and leader, seeking to kill him to earn a title for themselves. Shakya's soldiers try to shield Siddhartha, but they are easily wiped out. Kozala's leader, Chap Ra, tries to attack Siddhartha, but suddenly time seems to move slowly. The closer he gets to Siddhartha, the more illuminating he becomes. Siddhartha doesn't draw out his sword during this moment and just stares straight at Chap Ra. Chap Ra starts spitting blood, and his horse becomes restless. He ends up falling off, still spitting blood. Siddhartha and Chap Ra keep staring at each other, and Chap Ra realizes that things are different because it feels like Siddhartha is looking deep into his soul and judging him. Chap Ra hits the ground hard, and his men come around to check on him, but he passes away immediately. The Kozala soldiers are ordered to retreat immediately. A soldier tells Siddhartha to return to the army, and other soldiers yell at each other to retreat and protect the prince. Siddhartha retreats with the rest of the army. Under the night sky, with the moon illuminating the surroundings, Princess Yashodara, his wife, walks up to him, asking why he isn't resting. She mentions that he sits there every night until it's very late and asks if he has any concerns. He replies that humans die and get sick easily, wondering why he is unable to do anything. Siddhartha flips the page of a scroll in his hand and questions why people have to give up when they suffer from an incurable disease. He wonders aloud why they have to close their eyes while waiting for death to come and ease their suffering. Siddhartha believes life is full of suffering. As he stands up, memories flood back to when he traveled across the country and saw people suffering. He remembers a young slave boy getting trampled by a fruit merchant for stealing. The child, all shriveled up from hunger, holds onto the stolen orange, enduring the pain while the merchant continues stepping on him. Back in the present, Siddhartha tells Princess Yashodara that even though he was born a prince, he feels like he knows nothing. He thinks he's more ignorant than even the Sudras, a group of people. He expresses his desire to learn all about the world. Princess Yashodara hugs him from behind and says his name. Prince Siddhartha tells her to rest. A few years later, the royal family gathered at Princess Yasadhara's room because she just had a baby. Prince Siddhartha goes out on the palace porch to think. He tells himself that even though he learns a lot, 
All he sees is people suffering, and no one teaches him how to fix it. In his mind, he sees many people needing help, reaching out to him like they want to pull him into a dark hole. This is the horror of people suffering. Realizing that, as a future leader, he can't stop people from getting sick, growing old and dying, Siddhartha knows that these things are inevitable in the world of life. He understands he will go through all of them as a human and face death. He starts sinking into this thought, feeling the darkness around him. He struggles because he realizes life brings pain, and Siddhartha desperately wants to find a clear way to avoid that pain. He snaps out of his thoughts, finding himself sitting in a lotus position under a tree in the middle of the jungle. Determined, he thinks there must be something he can do. Siddhartha makes a big decision to leave everything behind and search for the truth. Late at night, he goes to his father's room while he's asleep. Feeling sad about possibly disappointing his father, Siddhartha quietly leaves a note, hoping for forgiveness. Stepping out, he mounts his horse and rides to the top of a hill, taking one last look at the city before heading off on his journey. A man named Chana catches up to Prince Siddhartha and begs him to come back. Siddhartha gets off his horse and tells Chana to take the horse back to the city. Then, he starts taking off all his royal ornaments and robe, throwing them on the ground. Chana picks up the valuable items and asks Siddhartha what he's doing. He is shocked to see Siddhartha take a knife and cut off all his hair until he's completely bald. Siddhartha hands his hair to Chana and instructs him to give it to Princess Yasadhara. Siddhartha tells Chana to tell the princess that he will be back after finding the path to success. Chana, crying for Siddhartha, watches as he walks away with only a robe around his waist. Siddhartha tells Chana to return with the horse and the other valuables, emphasizing his determination to seek a different path. Siddhartha sets off on his journey to find his own path. His mother Maya has been watching over him, believing in the prophecy that he will become a great person and erase the suffering of all living things. She wishes him well as he becomes an ascetic monk and travels across the world. Siddhartha's journey is tough. He relies on the kindness of strangers for food, sleeps wherever he can find shelter, and walks through harsh weather on foot. One day, he arrives at a village where people are suffering from severe hunger, almost lifeless on the ground. Siddhartha uses his robe to cover a shivering mother and child, surprising those who witness this compassionate gesture. Siddhartha spends some time in the village and heads towards the stream when a man approaches him. The man notices Siddhartha's growing hair and beard, telling him it's not good for a monk. He offers a razor to help trim Siddhartha's hair and beard, inviting him to his house to clean up. Siddhartha agrees. At the man's house, he gives Siddhartha a robe to wear, complimenting how good he looks in it. Another monk in the house asks for a cup of water, and the man happily goes to get it, excited to have two monks in his home. Siddhartha introduces himself to the other monk, who then surprises him by asking if he was the Shakyan prince. Taken aback, Siddhartha confirms it. The monk introduces himself as Defei. Their conversation gets interrupted when the man returns with the bowl of water and asks for a favor. He explains that his son wants to become a monk. His wife brings out the children, and she points to Asaji as the one who wishes to become a monk. Asaji already has his hair cut. Siddhartha and Defei bring Asaji along on their journey. As they travel together, Siddhartha asks Defa about the scar on his left eye. Defa tells him that while he was meditating on a rock, some people came and provoked him by saying that asceticism was pointless. He argues back, explaining that asceticism's purpose is to go beyond limits and be reborn in the next life. One of the people challenges him, asking why he doesn't burn his eyes if there's meaning in suffering. After hesitating for a moment, he grabs the torch and shocks everyone by scorching his left eye with it. He explains to Siddhartha that he was told there's no meaning in self-mortification, so he burned his eyes himself to prove them wrong. Defa shares that the most impressive act of asceticism he witnessed was a man transforming into a beast, living a life in nature without desires and distractions. He believes pushing the limits of self-mortification will lead to a great reincarnation. According to Defe, the more suffering one endures in life, the better they will be reborn in the next life. Asaji, smiling, is behind them, lying with a butterfly. Defe suggests to Siddhartha that they should go to the ascetic forest. Siddhartha doesn't argue, but remains skeptical about it. Walking through the swamp, the trio wades in the water. Asaji follows closely, but injures his foot on a thorny vine at the bottom of the river. Crying out in pain, he loses his balance and starts to drown. Siddhartha dives underwater, rushing to Asaji, and swims back to the surface with him in his hand. From that point on, Siddhartha carries Asaji on his back for the rest of the journey. They traverse various landscapes, from a scorching desert to a mountaintop with a waterfall, and through a jungle. Pausing at a river, Siddhartha tends to Asaji's wound before continuing down a mountain path. 
they reach a village, stopping to meditate and receiving offered food from the villagers. Journeying at night, they encounter a group of men on horses. The leader, recognizing Defei from their past encounter, calls out to him. Siddhartha quickly intervenes, explaining that Asaji is sick and needs urgent treatment. Tata, the man who helped them, takes good care of Asaji. He prepares some medicine in a pot and gives it to Siddhartha for Asaji to drink, explaining it's the only medicine they have. Siddhartha then asks Tata to heat up a blade for him. Tata wonders why Siddhartha needs the blade, and he says it's to suck out the bad stuff from Asaji's wound. Siddhartha does just that, sucking out the yucky stuff and then using the hot blade to close up the wound. Asaji yells because it hurts, but he faints right away. Tata tells everyone that Asaji isn't breathing. In his sleepy state, Asaji wonders if he's already dead when he hears a voice. It's Siddhartha's mother, now a god, telling him he can't die yet because he's meant to live alongside Siddhartha. She asks Asaji to please support Siddhartha. Siddhartha is doing CPR on Asaji, and suddenly Asaji starts sweating and coughs, showing he's alive. Both Tata and Siddhartha feel relieved and say he's a tough kid. Tata shares that in the past, he would have used his power to possess a bird and find better medicine. Difa, now awake, asks if Tata still has that power, but Tata explains he has lost it. Unfortunately, Asaji is still in danger as his fever won't go down unless his leg is healed. Defa shares with Tata that he heard from Naradatta about a mysterious child named Tata, who had the unique ability to possess things. It turns out, when Tata was a child, he could swap his body with animals. For many years, he remained a child, and his body didn't age. However, once he lost his powers, he suddenly became an adult. Defa mentions hearing that Tata doesn't age, but Tata corrects him, saying he's an adult now. Just then, a blind lady enters the room and asks if Tata has returned. Tata informs her that he's home with two monks and a child. When Siddhartha speaks, Megala recognizes his voice and drops the logs in her hands upon hearing him. They knew each other from before. When Siddhartha was a prince, he fell in love with Megala after she saved him from bandits who were bothering him. They spent time together and she took him around the village on a boat. Once, they fell into the river and started playing in it. When his father discovered their relationship, he ordered Megala to be executed. Siddhartha learned about this and burst into the throne room where his father was having a meeting. Filled with anger, he was ready to draw his sword against his own father. The guards and everyone else present pleaded with the young prince to calm down. Recognizing the seriousness in Siddhartha's eyes, the king suggested an alternative. He proposed that if Siddhartha married Princess Yasudhara, he would free Megalia. Siddhartha reluctantly agreed to the decision. However, upon arriving at the courtyard, Siddhartha discovered that a guard had burnt Megala's eyes with a sword as her punishment. Despite the pain, Megalia didn't harbor hatred towards Siddhartha and was happy to have met him. She wished for him to become a great king. The guards took her away and dropped her off, leaving her to wander despite her blindness. Siddhartha was so hurt that he scraped his finger against the pavement, causing it to bleed. Siddhartha is still in shock after seeing Megala after all those years. He apologizes to her, feeling remorseful for not becoming the great king she had wished for. Hurt, she runs out of the room. Tata, who has heard about Siddhartha's name, asks him if he is truly the prince and mentions he has been looking for Siddhartha. Tata informs Siddhartha that his village was attacked by Kozala soldiers, resulting in the murder of his family, friends, and the destruction of his village. Tata expresses his strong dislike for Kozala soldiers and reveals that he has been fighting against them. However, due to his social standing, there were limits to what he could achieve. Tata emphasizes that ending a war between countries is a task only a king can accomplish. He earnestly implores Siddhartha to become a king and destroy Kozala, as he seeks revenge for the suffering and losses he and his people endured. Outside, Megala pants heavily, trying to catch her breath while overhearing their conversation. Tata continues to pester Siddhartha to become a king. Siddhartha, however, asks him to wait for ten years. He explains that he plans to pass through Magadha and enter the ascetic forest. Siddhartha declares his intention to practice asceticism for the next decade. He adds that if he hasn't found his answer by then, he will return to his country. The next morning, Asaji wakes up and starts yelling about a whirlwind. He dashes out of the house, still shouting about it. Tata and the others don't believe him since it's sunny. Asaji races down the hill to the village, yelling to the villagers that a whirlwind is coming, telling them to evacuate. But sadly, no one responds to his urgent calls. Suddenly, the wind starts to pick up speed, swirling into a whirlwind. Asaji urgently tells the villagers to run as fast as they can. Unfortunately, it's too late, and the whirlwind is nearby. 
It tears through the village, sucking in stray villagers and ripping houses off the ground. In the chaos, Asaji manages to rescue a young child who is almost sucked into the wind. After a while, the winds pass and calm returns to the now torn up village. Siddhartha and the others arrive at the village, witnessing the chaos that unfolded. To their surprise, they discover that Asaji can predict the future. He had also foretold that he would die in four years, four months, and four days. Siddhartha, Defei, and Asaji set off for the forest to train. They journey across highlands, deserts, rice fields, villages, plains, and various other terrains until they reach their destination, the ascetic forest. In the forest, they observe various monks undergoing different challenges. Asaji walks up to a swamp where a man emerges, startling Asaji and causing him to fall backward. Siddhartha asks the man if submerging himself under the swamp is also a method of training. The man explains that it's a bottomless swamp for practicing holding one's breath. Defoe further explains various training methods to Siddhartha, like using a tree for hanging, burying oneself in the sand for fasting, and using a casket to clear the mind. Defa states that the ascetic forest is the most suitable place for such training. Siddhartha and Defa sit on a bush of thorns, meditating. Despite the flies disturbing them, they remain in the same position for a long time, completely ignoring the various weather conditions and happenings around them. Asaji doesn't participate, but watches them instead. Siddhartha is eager to discover what lies at the end after this self-mortification. They also attempt sand fasting, and by this point, both Siddhartha and Defa are already quite skinny. Siddhartha notices Asaji making markings on a tree and walks up to him. He asks what Asaji is doing and Asaji responds that he is counting the days. He explains that 365 markings on one tree represent one year and he will die on the fifth tree, saying it with a smile. Siddhartha questions why Asaji is already counting the days to his death, asking if he isn't scared of death but instead waiting for it. Asaji responds that he is scared but it cannot be helped. Siddhartha tells him that he would have gone insane if he were in Asaji's place. He then asks Asaji how he lives each day without fearing death. Asaji replies that he does so by fulfilling his purpose in life. Asaji jumps around, smiling, as he tells Siddhartha that he will be able to be reborn as something greater than a man. He adds that if Siddhartha fulfills his purpose, everyone will be saved. Siddhartha asks how he can do this, but Asaji just smiles in response. They continue their training, with Siddhartha going through the hanging, the casket, and doing the sand fast again while Defei is hanging. Defei keeps convincing him that agony and pain are their fastest ways to salvation. Siddhartha asks if Defei is suggesting he die in the process, to which Defei replies that it is the fastest way to cleanse themselves as the human body is corrupt. However, Siddhartha refuses the idea of dying. Defa says Siddhartha hasn't understood the meaning of asceticism and should just die instead, going as far as calling him a fool and suggesting he rot in hell. Siddhartha is scared but decides not to argue anymore. Meanwhile, Asaji continues marking the trees. Siddhartha begins to wonder if it's foolish to get absorbed in torturing oneself and questions if all these extreme practices will really lead to salvation. Siddhartha faces a tough time, but thankfully, Tata steps in to help him out. Tata brings Siddhartha to a river and gives him water, saving him from being really, really thirsty. Siddhartha wonders why Tata came to his rescue, and Tata says he won't let Siddhartha die from the training. Tata even offers him an apple, but Siddhartha says no because he's fasting. Tata tries to force Siddhartha to eat, but then some monks come over. Bifei, the leader, comes up first and asks Tata if he's the one who took Siddhartha from his training. Defa shouts at Tata, telling him not to bother Siddhartha's training, and even calls him a devil for distracting Siddhartha. Tata asks Defe if he's seriously okay with Siddhartha dying, turning to give Siddhartha the app, e, but Siddhartha still says no to the apple. Defa says that dying while doing tough training brings eternal glory, and Tata shouldn't mess with Siddhartha's training. Defa shouts at Tata to go away, and the other monks start chanting for Tata to leave. Suddenly, Tata notices smoke and runs towards the shack where Megala is. It's on fire! Siddhartha, hearing Megala's name, becomes more aware. Tata hurries and finds some monks burning the shack. He pushes them out of the way and dashes into the burning shack, yelling for Megala. Spotting her in a corner, he quickly grabs her and carries her out just before the shack collapses completely. Tata takes Megala to hide in a cave. When Siddhartha comes near, Tata warns that he'll cut anyone who gets close. Siddhartha identifies himself, and Tata calms down. Siddhartha asks about Megala's condition, and Tata says she's sick. Siddhartha wants to see her, but Tata explains she's too unwell to meet him. They came to save Siddhartha, not the other way around. 
Fidartha decides to enter the cave and meet Miguela, but she shouts at him not to come closer. She's in pain, gasping heavily and crying as her body is covered in boils. Fidartha kneels beside her, deeply affected by her condition, and asks how much more she has to endure. In the next training session, which involves hanging off a rope over a cliff, Defa asks Siddhartha if he's thinking about Megala. Defa instructs him to focus on the training, but Siddhartha says he can't ignore people suffering. Defa insists that it's wrong for someone in the ascetic forest not to practice asceticism. Siddhartha argues back, saying they don't understand and nobody in the forest is experiencing as much pain as Megala. Tata takes care of Megalia, bringing food for her, but she doesn't want to eat it. She tells him to go wherever he wants because there's no hope for her anymore. Tata says she shouldn't talk like that, but she insists that if she dies, he'll be free. He puts the food aside, hugs her, and promises to save her. Siddhartha watches this happening from outside the cave. Asaji opens the coffin where Siddhartha is and Siddhartha asks if there's no hope for saving Megalia. Asaji assures him that he will rescue her. Siddhartha wonders how Asaji plans to save her, and Asaji says he'll do it the same way he saved Siddhartha. Siddhartha starts sucking out the pus from Megala's body. Tata tries to stop him, but Siddhartha insists it's the only way to save her. Tata offers to do it instead, worried that Siddhartha might catch her disease. Siddhartha tells Tata that if he gets tired, they can switch, and they should work together. Megala feels ashamed, crying and calling herself filthy, but Siddhartha reassures her, saying she's not filthy, and he will make sure to remove all the poison or pus. The next day, Siddhartha interrupts his meditation to check on Megala. Shepa notices him leaving and gets angry, wondering how long Siddhartha will keep trying to save her. When Siddhartha arrives, he sees that she has almost completely recovered from her illness. Megala and Tata Neil, grateful, asking Siddhartha how they could ever repay him. Defe and some monks come to the cave, accusing him of neglecting his monk training to be with them. Defe tells Siddhartha to leave, and the other monks support him. Tata interrupts, telling Siddhartha that he will leave with Megala, and Siddhartha should continue his training. He asks Siddhartha to forget the promise about returning to his country and becoming a king because he let go of his anger when they were treating Megala, and now he understands how important Siddhartha's actions are. Megala adds that she had cursed herself, feeling angry for falling in love with him and getting her heart broken and been made blind. Now that they've met again, she feels alive and thanks Siddhartha for not only saving her body but also her heart. As Tata leaves, he tells Siddhartha that once he becomes a great monk, he should make him his first disciple. That night, Asaji is marking the tree and tells Siddhartha that on the night of the next full moon, he would die. Siddhartha asks Asaji how he would die when he looks so healthy. Asaji tells him that he will die by being eaten by starving beasts. Siddhartha questions Asaji about whether the prediction of his death is accurate and if he will truly face such a tragic end. Asaji confirms it, still smiling. Siddhartha promises Asaji that no matter what happens, he will always be his best friend and will protect him. Asaji falls off a cliff while trying to reach for some eggs in a nest. Siddhartha is meditating when he hears Asaji's screams and quickly rushes to help him. Siddhartha reaches the bottom of the mountain and finds Asaji safe. While fishing, Asaji falls into the river. Siddhartha interrupts his meditation once again to quickly rush to his aid. Fortunately, he finds Asaji safe, smiling and waving at him. On the night of the full moon, Siddhartha stops meditating and decides he won't let Asaji die which he plans to do as he already tied Asaji to a tree branch. Suddenly, a rabbit climbs the tree where Asaji is, and it starts nibbling on the rope. The rope snaps, and Siddhartha wakes up from his sleep. Asaji is gone, and Siddhartha quickly looks around to find him. Meanwhile, Asaji willingly follows the rabbit into the forest. He walks past a bush and accidentally falls into a hole full of wolves. Asaji sees baby wolves whimpering because they're hungry. Asaji goes and comforts the baby wolves, telling them they'll get food soon. He lies down on the ground as two adult wolves come closer. Fidartha arrives at the hole, shocked and in tears, seeing the wolves tearing Asaji's body into pieces. Siddhartha cries out in horror and flees from the dreadful sight. He runs until tripping and falling face flat on the grassy ground, mourning for Asaji. As days go by, Siddhartha subjects himself to extremely painful ascetic practices. He forces his way through a prickly thorn bush, the needles piercing his flesh. He walks across scorching fire, burning the whole of his body. He even binds himself to a tree trunk, allowing hungry ravens to peck at his body. The other monks come and chase the birds away, begging him to stop, and they understand his self-mortification. They then acknowledge he's an excellent monk, but he tells them that he hasn't suffered enough. 
They are worried as Siddhartha has been doing these training practices since Asaji died, to the extent that for the past 10 days he hasn't even drunk water. He passes by Defai, who finally acknowledges that Siddhartha has achieved the greatest state of asceticism. He sits atop a bed of thorns to meditate on a cold cliff, while rain pours and thunder cracks. He repeats to himself that he will become a rock, and in the storm he will become the water, but the heavy winds prove too powerful. They blow him off the top of the cliff, and he plunges into the stream of water below. His body floats down the river, and he assumes he has become one with nature. He survives as he lays on the shallow part of the stream, but he is unable to move. He lies there with his eyes open, occasionally closing them. He wonders if this is the death at the end of self-mortification that Defei talked about. As he closes his eyes, he reaches a trance state, then he hears the voice of his mother calling out to him, telling him not to die. She then appears before him, saying that Asaji was born to be eaten by wolves to convey to him that all life is connected. Siddhartha asks if Asaji's death was to teach him the laws of nature, which his mother affirms, causing him to cry at the tragedy of Asaji's fate. Before she disappears, she urges him to stay alive, but Siddhartha didn't know this was his mother because he asked who she was just as she vanishes. He wakes up to the smell of steaming hot porridge and gulps it down in one sitting, not caring how hot it is. Tears roll down his eyes as an image of a smiling Asaji flashes before him. As he comes back to reality, he finds himself face to face with a woman who is thankful he is alright. She asks him if he would like a second serving of porridge. He looks around for a bit for the nearby monks, but smiles and cries again. He tells her that her rice porridge has saved his life. He then thanks her. As he walks away, some animals flock towards him. He freshens himself in a stream and, feeling enlightened, he beckons the animals to come closer, saying he has a story for them while he packs his hair into a bun. The animals follow him and he tells them a story. He explains to the animals that to live is to support another life and that eating for survival is the law of nature. He points out that if the wolves that ate Asaji were full, then his death was not in vain. He says only humans continue to fight and slaughter in vain, because of this a great suffering is born. He is leaving when he meets Defa standing under a tree. Defa asks him if he is running away, but he replies that he would no longer be going to the ascetic forest. Defa tells him that he will continue his self-mortification until he dies and surpass him, showing him the rightness in asceticism. Siddhartha tells him that radical pursuits are meaningless and proceeds to tell him a proverb. He tells Defa that he will not pursue extreme asceticism or pleasure, and he will instead live a moderate life, walking a calm and wide path. Defa tells him that he sees Siddhartha has found his own path, but he would continue to walk the path that he believes in. Siddhartha walks a while from the forest and is met by a group of horsemen who surround him with spears. Their general, Prince Viradhaka, calls him out as Prince Siddhartha of Shakya, but he tells him that he is no longer a prince. The prince comes down from his horse and points his sword at Siddhartha. He tells him that his family made him suffer and he would make sure he perishes. He asks Siddhartha if he feels sad and further asks him if he hates him. He tells Siddhartha to take the sword from his hand and face him. Siddhartha calmly tells him that he must be a poor soul and if he is going to kill him, he should just do it. He tells him that he does not hate him, but pities him. Prince Viradhaka is confused. He asks Siddhartha what he is talking about and even after threatening to kill his people and family, Siddhartha is not bothered. Siddhartha asks him if he enjoys his revenge and if it has brought him joy even once or if it makes him suffer at night. This angers him as he is about to strike Siddhartha with his sword. But suddenly, lightning strikes the sword, causing it to fall from his hand. Siddhartha picks up the sword and moves towards Prince Viradhaka. He orders his men to kill Siddhartha. They surround him but instantly back off due to an unknown force that stops them. Fadartha hands him back his sword, telling him that he would continue to feel regret until the day he dies, suffering an eternity, and that is crueler than torture, wounds, or illness. For this reason, he pities him. He hands the sword to the young general, who retreats and tells his men to withdraw. Siddhartha is meditating in front of a swamp when a person emerges from the swamp, entranced by the sight of Siddhartha meditating. He slowly approaches him and falls on his knees, saying that he wants to die, as he is the most unfortunate one in the world. Siddhartha asks him why he is unhappy. He replies that his father and mother were trampled on by an elephant and died, and his second mother died by an epidemic. Siddhartha replies to him, saying that his parents were the more unfortunate ones. The swamp man tells a story about the young prince Viradhaka, who had abandoned his mother. 
The Swamp Man argues that the prince was cruel for letting his mother die just because his mother was a slave, so why does the prince not receive any punishments? Siddhartha replies that the prince Viridhaka was also suffering because even though he was the prince, he had to helplessly watch his mother die. His sorrow was much deeper because he had killed countless people and even let his mother die and the prince had to live the rest of his life filled with regret until the day he died. The prince arrives at a shallow grave where a pack of hyenas had gathered around, he chased them away with his sword. He then begins to dig out the place which is actually where his mother had been buried. He dug her out of the ground and clung to her, crying and telling her lifeless body to look upon his face and call out to him. He says he had acted cold in front of the king aides just to please the king, he asks his lifeless mother's body for forgiveness. Siddhartha tells the swamp man that the prince is also an unfortunate person, and that everyone carries their own burdens. Siddhartha tells him that he has suffered, hence why he should understand other people's suffering more than anyone. The word Siddhartha says hits him deep, and he falls to his knees, banging his head and hands on the floor. As Siddhartha says that there are more unfortunate people out there. He asks Siddhartha that if everyone is unhappy, then why are they in the world, why do people still live? Siddhartha places his hand on his shoulder, Siddhartha body begins to glow, and slowly spreads to the surrounding area. Siddhartha tells him that his mother had died a few days after giving birth to him, and that she now watches over him. He tells him that due to the fact that his mother gave birth to him, he was able to meet him. And just as nature has its purpose, every person has his own purpose in life, for we are all connected to all the things in nature and form a bond with them. The light spreads across the whole forest and expands further out. Siddhartha tells the swamp man that he has a role to play in life just by existing, and they were people that were saved just by meeting him, like his parents being happy he was born, which made the swamp man lighten up in realization. Siddhartha adds that even Prince Viridhaka's mother must have been overjoyed at being treated kindly by him. He tells him that the prince must also have found comfort in his kindness towards his mother making her not feel alone. He asks Siddhartha if it is okay for him to live, and if he actually has a role in life to play, as he had killed and hurt many people. Siddhartha says yes. He asks for Siddhartha's name, which he gives to him. He tells him that he is a good person and he wishes to become his disciple. He tells him that he can't at the moment as he is still in the middle of training and is also mourning. The swamp man tells Siddhartha that when he finishes his training and he becomes a great person, he would come immediately. Siddhartha tells him that he does not know how long it would take. The swamp man responds that he would wait as long as possible and wait somewhere far away. He thanks Siddhartha for teaching him the meaning of life and returns to the water. Siddhartha stops glowing and wonders to himself when he taught the swamp man and when he had said all he said and why he said all those things. As the sun rises over the horizon, he hears a voice telling him that he had been enlightened and he is now called Buddha, the Awakened One. The voice tells him that as long as there is still life, he shall spread his teachings to all the people of the world and teach people how they should live. He realizes that he's made everyone he's ever encountered happy. He enters a trance state as his mother tells him he has attained a world that the door of his heart has opened. She explains that people are born on a lotus flower, and when it bloom it carries unlimited potential. His mother calls him by his new name Buddha, the Awakened One, and tells him to make the flower within people's hearts to blossom. He replies that as long as there is life in him, he would fulfill the role given to him. The war comes to an end as Prince Viridhaka ceases fire and the people of Kozala were able to go back to the city to live their normal life. Tata and Megalia finds happiness, as well as Asaji who is playing with butterflies sin the afterlife. Defei and the monks are still walking their path, while Siddhartha, the awakened Buddha continues his journey. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.